Who are you? I'm Molly Knox Osterteig. I live I live in Los Angeles. I write and draw. Um, I'm known for making some uh, middle grade graphic novels called the Witch Boy series. I'm known for some animation writing, and uh, I'm gay, <laughs> and just hanging out, just trying to have a good time. <laughs> I'm about to turn 29. My birthday's in um, two days. So I'm like grappling with that and yeah. What are the three things you value most in life? Oh, okay. We're getting like right, right into the questions. I love it. Um, I, why are you, yeah, it's such a real question. It's 10 in the morning. Um, <laughs> I really value, uh, I think that I, my, my personal like life theory at this point in my life is that human connection is the most important, is like the point of everything. I think that like art, is like ultimately about human connection so that is kind of like my top thing is um connecting with other people i value creation i value making making work and being able to sort of again that's sort of tied in because it's it's taking something that's inside your head and making it tangible um and like sharing a part of yourself and so i find that very uh rewarding um and i value i think empathy is like the biggest trait that I, I I think is like the most important trait, being able to relate to other people. So I guess they're all very socially focused um, values. But yeah, yeah, those are my top my top three. Tell me a memory which shaped you. So I'm in okay, so I'm, I'm um, in like Lord of the Rings brain rot right now. That's been my quarantine hobby. I've been going getting really, really obsessed. Um, so I, that's like all I have memories of right now. <laughs> um, but my dad read me uh, the Lord of the Rings when I was a kid. And my dad and I are very alike in a lot of ways. We're nerdy and we both like cry very easily. It's the part in Lord of the Rings where Sam is invited to go on the quest with Frodo, who he's in love with. And he jumps off like a dog, excited to go on a walk and bursts into tears. And I have such a clear memory. I was probably like six or seven. And I remember my dad reading it to me. And then like he started crying too. And I was just like, something about this character is very important. And something about like, that level of like loyalty and simpleness is like very um uh like a quality that is really good and so it's like that is very much in my head um when i'm writing and when i'm just trying to be a person as <laughs> that's like a trait that i try to <laughs> try to uh, live by i just want to say that i did sign you you put put a thing on twitter about the all your takes are canon that one i signed <laughs> i signed oh, yeah thank you because, <laughs> Yes, I think I'm right about <laughs> Lord of the Rings uh, for me is is like a it's a weird property where I have a lot of memories connected to it. But I when I sat down and I read the books, I was like, these these are really really good. I I love these and I love how much passion people can put into them. Like I have a couple of friends that are like really mm-hmm. interested in Lord of the Rings, and I had a cousin who was super interested, and like I'm I'm just fascinated by it. And I I I try and find I try and consume lots of Lord of the Rings media as if I really loved it because I want to find the spark, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It's very, and it's, that kind of spark is so interesting to me because it, yeah, it's definitely the the property I've felt the most passionately about. And I think because I was like watching it and reading it when I was very young. So I was really, really obsessed. And it's like, yeah, I, I feel like that's, it's very precious to love something so much. It's very special. What's your favorite color? My favorite color right now, um, it's like a pale uh, burnt orange, like almost mm. like a coral color. Yeah, it changes. Earlier this year, it was like a bright orange. Last year, it was emerald green. So I feel like there's like colors that like turn up in my life and I'm like, this is the last <laughs> color for the year. So it's sort of a, a dark coral right now. Tell me in as much detail as you can about something you know of which once existed and now does not. Yeah, okay, so talking about quarantine makes me think about something that doesn't exist right now, um, which was uh, going to uh, uh, gay dance parties, um, like clubs, which I never did that much, but this was supposed to be the year. I had just found this amazing um, uh, queer party in Los Angeles that happened once a month, and we went for New Year's, and it was so incredible like it was just so like like being surrounded by people and being so happy and like dancing to like robin songs um there was like a balloon drop it was just it was like a really magical night and it kind of felt like it it felt like the kind of like like night that you like is very very rare and very special um and then I was supposed to go again in February 
And I remember standing in line and the line was really, really long because we got there late and we're waiting and waiting. It was about an hour. And then we're like, let's just go home. Like, this is not worth it. And it doesn't happen anymore, of course. And it probably will not happen again. Um, And I really wish that I had gone in that night. Um, But also, I'm just glad that I went at all. And I think it's, even if it happens again, I think like, like this year has been a little bit of a bridge year for me between like 20s and 30s. And I feel like I'm like becoming more of an adult, becoming a little bit more like settled and domestic. And I don't know if I'm going to like go out partying as much once it is safe to do so. Like, I don't know if I'll want to do that as much anymore. Um, So that's kind of like, it was like, just like one very special night that will not happen again. But I'm really glad that I got to have it. What, if anything, is perfect? I think I don't, um, there's lots of things that I'll, I'll say are perfect. Like, it was a perfect dinner or a perfect sunset or a perfect book. Um, but I sort of don't think anything is perfect. Or I think it's just, I think that's a very arbitrary uh, descript- description that most things don't apply to. Yeah, I think I don't, I think I don't, like, seriously think anything is perfect. But I also think that there is beauty in the imperfection. <laughs> Who is your favorite character from fiction of any kind and why? Mm, I do. I do love Sam Gamgee. I'm holding a little figurine right now of Sam Gamgee. Um, Yeah, I think he's definitely my favorite right now. I've it probably that answer would change depending on what I was currently obsessed with. But um, I think that's he's a very good one because he is very he is the hero of a story, but he is very simple. He's very humble. He has absolutely no ego. He's very devoted to others. Um, and he's just sort of trying to, he's like letting himself be guided by love. And every time he kind of uh, questions that love or is like, I should do something because it's the responsible thing to do or like technically the right thing to do, but it's it's not following my heart. Like that it's always the wrong choice. And so he's just this very pure character who's very um, morally sound in like this really lovely way. Um yeah, I love that he doesn't want power or to win or to vanquish anything. He really just wants, like, the people that he cares about to be happy and, like, wants the world in general to be happy. But he also, like, sticks up for things when they're wrong. Like, he's not a pushover. Um, so he is, he's sort of, like, definitely my my comfort character um, and my sort of, like, what would Sam do? <laughs> the paladin of love, as I've heard him described. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's just very, he's, I think I love him because um, sometimes it can feel like a vulnerability to be really devoted or really loyal. It can feel like, like you're, you're being weak, um, or you're like, might be able to be taken advantage of. Um, And I really love that for him, it is this strength and this like heroic trait. um, That is like, very, very beautiful to me. So yeah, I think he's as, as I've been, as I've been going deeper into this like like specific quarantine obsession like he's been the character that I'm just like so happy about what fascinates you okay right now I love seeing I love seeing people do things that they're good at and like doing crafts um right now the thing that I'm really fascinated by we're watching this uh uh reality show called the great pottery throwdown uh, which is British it's BBC and it's a bunch of potters um just like throwing things on wheels and making sculptures and it's so cool I had no idea how cool pottery is it's like the way they talk about it they all seem to be incredibly zen like it's this thing where like you you make the you make the pot and no matter how good you are it's going to go in the kiln and something might happen that you don't anticipate it might explode and there everyone is so like calm about it um in a way that I really love and it's also just this cool like like clay like coming from the inside of the earth and then being shaped and then being fired into something incredibly strong. Like, and like we, I, I feel like civilization kind of comes from clay because it's like we have to like have vessels to carry things. And so it's, it feels like this very old, very amazing craft. Yeah, there's, there's something about like the way that the clay that they make looks so natural. It looks like a stone almost. Like it looks like something that you would discover from the earth, but it's made by human hands. And then like, they leave like their thumbprints on it. It's just, and then it can last for thousands of years. Like there's something so emotional about it. I have definitely <laughs> cried watching this uh, pottery reality <laughs> show. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. That's so cool. <laughs> it's really good. Uh, what is the most valuable thing you've ever learned? 
I'm trying to think how to put it into words exactly. Um, I think I'm, I'm also a pretty anxious person. Um, and I, <clears throat> uh, tend to like look forward and look backwards a lot of being like, oh, I shouldn't have done this. Or here is what I have to plan what I'm going to do in the future. I have to be able to predict every outcome. Um, and so it's a lot of kind of going backwards and forwards and not being um, in the present. And I think this year and last year, um, just like a variety of things, both quarantine, also I got married and like my wedding was so fucking nice. Um, and just like, it sort of helped me realize that in having an enjoyable moment, having a, for, I mean, I said that I don't use the word perfect, but I do like having a perfect moment. You don't need to preserve it. And it doesn't need to be something that there doesn't need to be like, you can even regret parts of it later. But like, if you had that joy and you had that perfect day, like it still matters and it stays with you. Um, so I think that that sort of has given me, I think I always used to have this anxiety over like, I'm having a nice time, but later I will not have a nice time. So I have to worry about that now or like, oh, maybe I'll regret some part of this nice time and wish I'd done something better or differently. Um, and I think I, the last couple, last two years have been really just learning, like, if you have a nice time, that is what counts. There's nothing guaranteed beyond that. Um, and uh, you just are sort of like, you just get to be lucky and like grateful to have it. It's like, I mean, it's, it's funny because it almost is this, um, for my, my kind of anxiety, I feel like everything is like perfectible. And so it's just like everything has to be perfect. And if it's not perfect, then like, it's like almost like things have to be perfect as a safety mechanism. Cause like, if they're not perfect, then I don't know what's going to happen. And kind of just being, just realizing it's like a little bit nihilist to be like, nothing is perfect and nothing lasts and nothing is guaranteed. And those are like very heavy, <laughs> but they also are kind of freeing. Cause it's just, mm. it's, it's cause you're just like, when I get something special, I was never promised this. I was never guaranteed this. It might never come again, so I'm going to enjoy it. Um, and yeah, there's there's something nice about that. It's been helpful this year. <laughs> if you could name a hot sauce, what would you call it and why? Oh, hot sauce. <laughs> it's a hard one. Um, I'm trying to think because I don't usually use hot sauce that much because I'm a white person. And <laughs> tender taste buds. <laughs> probably, I'm just going to stay on Lord of the Rings because it's the only place my head is at. I'd probably call it um, the cracks of doom after the map, the, the fires in which the ring is forged. <laughs> I, I think that would be good for a very hot, hot sauce. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. I, I love hot sauce. I love it so much. <laughs> I just drizzle like everything. I'm like... Just, oh my god i don't want to taste like i don't want to have a face just <laughs> ah. <laughs> it's so good uh it's really funny and, and that's like throughout the show the questions kind of alter and, and change like over the course of the 18 some episodes that i've done but that has always been in the show because that's my favorite <laughs> i love that that's, that's my favorite question because i i get some really like interesting and unique answers and i i love the, the cracks too that's fantastic <laughs> cracks uh, of doom what would you name a hot sauce uh, what would I call a hot sauce? I see. I've never thought of it. Um, <laughs> hmm. What I call a hot sauce? I think I call I call it Hedgehog's Kiss. Cute. <laughs> because I I love yes. hedgehogs, and mm -hmm. they're my favorite animal. They just make me happy, and and I just see one, and I'm like, that's a boy in his happy space, and I just want yeah. yeah, I just I just want to give you a hug. But if you hug a hedgehog, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so hedgehog's kiss because uh, that's very cute that's where, i like that that's where my heart is at the minute so yeah. yeah what is your most prized physical possession so it's i'm trying to think of what it would be i have a lot of i, I i've started collecting um like art like original pieces of art lately from cartoonists and illustrators that i like and so i have i i'm not sure which one is my favorite but i, I have a lot of these you know original pieces that are just it's so special to have the unique version of something and to have like the version that, that the artist touched. Um, and I think especially in like digital, like most art is digital, all the art I make is digital. So I'm so amazed when I have a piece, um, I actually have this, it's on my wall. It's the cover of a, um, Tamara Pierce novel, oh, which wow. I loved when I was a kid. And, um, I just love this artist so much. And this is like colored pencils and it's so <laughs> beautiful and so detailed and tiny. And I, um, like wrote to her 
Uh, her name is Marilee Heyer, and the piece is called In the Hand of the Goddess. And I sort of found her website, and I saw that she had originals for sale, and they weren't that expensive. And I, I, but I couldn't find her email or anything, so I sent her like a physical letter because she had her. <laughs> mailing address for some reason on the internet and we like exchanged a correspondence and then i finally finally she like sent it to me um and so that's there's something very very special that's one of my favorite things i love I have. I, my handwriting sucks but i love writing letters so much yeah i love it there's something tactile about like hello i hope this letter finds you well and just yeah. said thing. i i exchange letters with uh, a friend of mine we we make a point of like at least once a month sending a letter uh, that's really sweet what inspires you? Um, I'm in a weird place right now. I'm having, I'm, I'm in like a weird uh, artistic like drought right now, which is fine and normal. Um, so it's a little bit of a hard question, but I think the most reliable source of inspiration for me, I really love stories and I love getting lost in stories. I think all of my favorite, favorite things are kind of like worlds that you can get lost in. Um, but I'm, as a, as an artist and a writer, I'm really interested in telling stories that don't exist yet and kind of doing things that we haven't seen before or like um, exploring like morals or lessons that haven't really been, that aren't a part of like standard storytelling um, or sort of exploring different character types or subverting um, stereotypes and tropes. Um, so that's kind of, I think when I am like having trouble coming up with a story that's often like like the way in that I'll try to do is like what's something that I would like to see flipped on its head or like what's something what's something like like we were talking about like the most important lesson you've learned like like how can you put that in a story and so often stories tell these really simple lessons that I don't always agree with and so kind of trying to like get more in depth right now I'm really really interested and really enjoying telling stories with with queer characters and not just not just like like having a character who happens to be queer, but being like, why does your specific identity and the way you move through the world like affect your story? How does that and like are there sort of like like lessons from queerness that haven't been haven't made made it into the mainstream very much? Um, so that's something I'm really really interested in exploring right now. Like time, uh, it's a weird one that just popped into my head as, as you mentioned lessons that I've seen no one talk about the fact that like a lot of queer people are going like I didn't expect to live past like 22 23 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you're like well how freeing will a person feel if they set a timer had a timer in their head that went off and nothing bad happened yeah yeah so they had this doomsday clock that that hit the end and then they're like oh okay I'm I'm still here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's, yeah. That's like that's rad. I want to hear a story about that. You know, like I want to hear someone just wake up and go, "Huh, I should." I thought I wasn't going to be here. What do I do now? And I like the kind of yeah. like a yeah. I don't know. Which uh, and I, I love that because so often stories about queer people in media do have us die because they cannot imagine what our lives look like. You know, they have. The tragic, yeah, the tragic queer person dead, the lesbians get together and then one of them dies. Like, it's such a trope. And it's it's because these writers do not know what our lives look like and because we almost don't know what our lives look like. And so it's, yeah, it's really, yeah, that's a really, really emotional thing to explore. Yeah, I'm interested in it with relationships and romance too and just, just the ways in which it's different and the ways in which, like, so often when people are trying to write a queer romance, they're still... Um, still sort of writing a straight romance and just like like changing the characters in it and to be like actually there's these levels of difference um that are so so interesting and like so i like have barely been explored um mm. so that's really fun to me did you ever have an epiphany if so what was it about um i think uh uh one time that i remember having a really specific epiphany um so i'm gonna give context i know that you interviewed my friend brendan lee mulligan Mm -hmm. A while ago, did he talk about like LARP camp Wayfinder? Yes. At all? Yeah. So we, I know Brennan because we both went to live action role playing summer camp, which was like a very formative and very complicated experience. Um, but one of my sort of clearest like memories of that time, I think I was a late teen, I was probably like 17 or 18. Um, and we were doing a horror game. So it was very much like horror genre. I think the premise was. Um, we were a group of like school kids and teachers on a field trip and our bus had crashed um, in the middle of this like 
forest cult that was doing a wild hunt. And so like a bunch of us were going to get sacrificed. Um, and there were like so many monsters and stuff. And it was really, really scary. Um, and I got so wrapped up in the story in this way that I didn't usually, like, I usually was sort of aware that I was playing, but this, it was like, you know, a real world. I was just playing someone like myself. And so it really felt like, like I was maybe like getting hunted through the forest. And it was such a clear, I had such a clear, um, feeling of like, oh, I do not want to die here <laughs> and I really <laughs> might die. And like, I have to do everything I can to survive. And I think like, that's such a, it's like, that's a very, um, you know, most, most people have that. It's like an animal instinct, but I had never felt it before. Um, consciously, like I just never had thought of it. And I think I'd been surrounded by some, some death and some, um, people who were like, uh, trying to self-harm. And so it was like, that realization it like in that time and in that time in my life was really really important of like oh I'm going to fight very hard to hold on to that this and so that was like that was big and it was from it was from LARPing did did you get sacrificed I or did, did you get escape? sacrificed ah. it was so scary I was so upset <laughs> I really needed to I really needed a little time after the game to sort of calm down from it because it was so intense um it was pretty cool, though. It was a cath cathartic experience. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry you got sacrificed, mm -hmm. but I'm glad it gave you it gave you that realization. Yeah. It wasn't a real sacrifice. I yeah. think that's, yeah, that's like the, um, yeah, the, the coolest thing about LARP camp was being able to have like experiences like that that are kind of, you get to get very into a, a situation, but it is not real. And you sort of ultimately in the back of your mind know that you're safe. Um, so you can really let yourself get lost in it. If you could say all of your work had a theme, what would that theme be? The theme of my work is always about rejecting the things you think you're supposed to be or do um, and finding connection with other people, um, which I think is, yeah, is, is, is like those are like the lessons that I like am also trying to learn in my life. So I try to put it in my work to like work through it. Isn't it so cool that we in work we can kind of calcify beliefs that we don't yet have in the hopes that we will get them yes like yeah when i'm writing like poetry and stuff i'm like well i don't really know if i believe this i'm i'm actually way sadder than this poem lets on about this topic but if i say it enough times i can maybe convince myself yeah. that it yeah um, no i legitimately Gave like learned some lessons about love and romance from writing a Sam Frodo fan fiction. <laughs> like I truly, <laughs> I'm like it's the best thing I've ever written. I don't know how to put it into like something I can actually share with people, but it's like I worked through these like themes of love that I had been struggling with personally for a long time, and it it's it's amazing that you can do that. You can sort of trick yourself <laughs> into learning lessons. What makes you smile? Um. Lots of things. I love to cook. I love, I think I already talked about dance parties in the kitchen to musical numbers. I love to, I, I never used to sing and then um, my wife sings a lot. Um, it has a much better voice than me, but we sing a lot together, which is makes me really happy. Um, and I love when people, I love watching TV when people are very nice to each other. It really gets me. <laughs> um, I love, uh, I love my pets. And like saying good morning to them every morning. Um, right now I have Winston, my dog, just like, I think he's dark, so you can't really see him, but he's like pressed into my stomach right now. Um, yeah, I love, I think the most like wholesome and pure thing that I do is go to the farmer's market and get flowers like pretty much every week as often as I can. And the, I really love the, the guy who sells flowers there. And we always, I'm just like, it makes me feel like I'm in like a cute indie movie or something to be like walking through my neighborhood with flowers. But it's just like, it's like little, very little things where it's just like, this is so pleasant and sweet and beautiful and like uncomplicated. Um, yeah, that's, that's usually what makes me smile. How do you feel about death? I don't, I, I haven't, I don't know. I haven't had to encounter it for a little while. Um, whenever I've encountered it, it feels like this, like very, um, very big, very powerful kind of like unknowable thing. Um, and so I'm kind of curious, like in that sense, I'm, but it's, I think it's scary because I'm a human being and an animal. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. I definitely, um, 
I think like the, the closest I've been to it was like having a close friend um, pass away in kind of a dramatic way. Um, and just feeling like it made me so aware of time of like, there was this moment when he was alive and then there was a moment when he was dead. And then there was a moment when I heard it, when I realized that he was dead and like, there's no, like, you cannot go back and forth between those moments, even though they feel so close. Um, so that was kind of, that was very, is very intense. Um, yeah, it's, it's something that I think it's something I'm very interested in. I'm kind of like, every time I ask this question, I'm like, because I kind of got over, I guess helped me kind of get over my own fear of death, but loss is a different thing. And I don't know, I'm hoping someone will eventually say something to me that'll be like, oh, maybe I'm not going to be afraid of losing anything. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. 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 I think it, it really makes you um, aware of the passage of time in this way that's really feels, it feels, it's just so uh, br- brutal, I guess, and very like, you cannot mm. change it. But it also, I mean, I think it sort of goes back to what we were talking about before about mindfulness and being present and how it just is, it's not a bad thing always to remember that you could lose everything like because it Mm -hmm. it's it's the things are not guaranteed but it's yeah it's it's very it's very emotionally difficult as well like the the stoics so i'm a big into philosophy Mm -hmm. and the stoics had this thing which was memento mori you know remember you will die every single day when you're like hugging your wife or whatever you're supposed to remember that this could all be gone and i'm like i can't live my life like yeah. that i mean I, yeah <laughs> i can't yeah but i mean it's supposed, it supposedly helps but i can't i can't live my life like that tell me about something you learned recently that amused you okay let me think about what i've been up to <laughs> <laughs> okay there's something i haven't told this to almost anybody it's so funny though how many people do you have like a lot of people listening to this podcast okay <laughs> i'm i'm very small. okay <laughs> like my, my, my most recent um my most recent episode got like 36 lists. okay cool okay this will be like a yeah. little nugget for for people who who are paying attention um so and it's gonna be another lord of the rings thing it's just that's all that's all i've been doing um <laughs> So that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I, for some reason, uh, Sir Ian McKellen, who plays Gandalf in the movies, followed me on Twitter. I don't know why. I was just talking about Lord of the Rings, and I think he just really loves it. Um, and and I DM'd him because I I did. I was like, Hey, I just love your work. Like, thanks for all you do. I didn't expect a response. I did not get a response until um, a couple weeks ago. His like social media manager reached out to me, and they were like so nice to meet you. Like, like we're going to try to like get you to do an interview with Sir Ian McKellen, which I don't know if that will happen, but that would be really cool. But they're like, I need your help finding this very specific piece of fan art. I know that you retweeted it and it's a buff Legolas. <laughs> and so I like found it and it's this like, <laughs> it's, um, by this artist, uh, Cassie, who's a uh, curious curio on Twitter. And it's like a shirtless, like muscular Legolas and he's leaning against a wall and then like shirtless naked Gimli is there looking up at him and blushing. <laughs> and I just... The fact that <laughs> <laughs> Sir Ian McCullen, who is a very old, like flamboyantly gay man and like incredibly respected star of stage and screen, has like his social media manager looking for sexy Legolas art, like because he was he was like, I need you to find this. I know that Sir Ian is gonna want to see it. Like, <laughs> it made me so happy. I like got that DM and I was like alone um, on the beach and I was just laughing to myself like a crazy person. <laughs> It just made me so happy. Um, so that is wonderful. Uh, the, <laughs> I hope he doesn't hear this. I'm, I don't want to blow up his spot, but like, it's a good piece of art. Like, he has excellent taste. <laughs> I've, got, I've got two things, yes, right? Because yes. I have something. Uh, this is the one question I usually do answer. Every, but I've got one thing that I know you're going to enjoy. Okay. Uh, uh, Lord of the Rings related. Uh, and then two, I've just got the one that I had prepared for this okay. week. So uh, the, the one that I think you're going to enjoy is I discovered I was on like a YouTube rabbit hole and I discovered someone had redubbed the orcs in Lord of the Rings with normal human voices. Oh. My personal favorite part is when one of them says gosh. Gosh darn it. Like, I, love it. <laughs> I also like just um, the normal sniffing in it in the beginning. <laughs> uh the, the the thing the thing that i i learned that amused me this week and it didn't amuse me because of like the actual fact itself it, it just amused me because of the 
general way I learned it, which was that in 1995, South Africa won the World Cup, which is a very like standard bug, standard mm-hmm. piece of information. But the way I learned it was um, at three o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I was like, oh my God, I have forgotten to brush my teeth. My mouth is mm. awful. I need to brush my teeth. I went to the bathroom to brush my teeth and I kind of glanced over and lynx can, do you know, they're like called axe in the US, like an axe can. Oh yeah. And they were, they were celebrating 25 years uh, of being in existence and, you know, 1995. And they had a bunch of facts about 1995. And one of them, at three o'clock in the morning while I was brushing my teeth that I just leaped out of me was South Africa won the World Cup in 1995 <laughs> and I will never forget that piece of information ever. That is one of the I feel like it's so funny sometimes you just get a little snippet and you're like I'm gonna remember this forever I'm gonna tie it yeah. to like like Link's body spray forever <laughs> and <laughs> so funny uh, The next time like I mean two a couple of days later my brother was wearing Link's and I was like South Africa won the World Cup in 1995. Did you Did you know that? Yeah, that's gonna happen. that will probably be for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, something in your brain was like, hey, this is important. Yeah, this, is, this is important. Yeah. Hey, Jinx. Uh, what is beautiful? Mm, I think almost everything. I really do. I love. It. I love. I think so many things are beautiful. Um, I think it's very beautiful. I think that everything in nature is beautiful, and I think it's very beautiful when people try hard which is a lot of things and then there's some things that are not beautiful that I think are like people being being cruel um but I really I really I feel very I just love I just I don't know it's it's funny I think um I uh realized that like I I was driving to Los Angeles from New York I was moving across the country um which America being very much bigger than Ireland is like a very long drive um it was like took like eight days and so much of it was through like Texas, which is very flat and boring and like a lot of like, like just like oil refineries and like, like, like gas stations and just not, not much of a view, but it, there was still something so special about it. I'd never seen anything. I never like driven in that part of the country before. Um, and just driving all day. I was just realizing like, oh, even these, these things that are sort of not supposed to be beautiful are very, um, yeah, just something, yeah, something of these, really, they can be so mundane, and they can even be kind of, yeah, like, not, not, not supposed to be beautiful in any way, but just, like, you can still find it, you can kind of see it if you look, um, and also just get so emotional about being, like, oh, what is the history of this place, and what has happened here, and what, what led to it existing, like, like, there's, it can, it can really, it really Like, how different would your life be if you lived there, in this gas station in the middle of Texas, you know, that's awesome yeah and that for some some people this is the most familiar place in the world like so into some people have these like really specific associations with it they're so interesting would you describe yourself as cute and cuddly i would yeah definitely (laughs) got a decent amount of self-confidence i think it's true (laughs) where do you feel safest i really love my house i think that's probably the answer and especially um Especially, well, it's like this year, especially in quarantine, we've been watching so much TV. Um, but there is just something so lovely about like being on the couch with my wife and like lying on them and or like having their legs on mine. And just it feels it just feels very centering um, and nice. And like sometimes we'll be drawing or sometimes we'll just be watching like stupid reality TV. Um, but that is very much the safest, the safest place to me. If you were on a starship. What position would you hold? Ooh, that's fun. Um, have you ever read the book uh, uh, "Long The Long Journey to a Small Angry Planet"? Yes, I only read I only read that during quarantine. Yeah. Oh yeah. my god, I love that. It's one of my favorite books. So I love the idea of the like um, algae pods, they, <laughs> like the way that the ships are powered by like algae doing photosynthesis or something I don't totally understand it but there's something very cool about um because I think there's a character who is like not a very nice character in the book but it's like his job to tend the algae and like make sure it's all in balance and there's something really cool about that to me of like being it's like it's like more biological than being an engineer but still being like you're like caring for this living thing and that's making the ship go through space so yeah yeah I'd be the, the botanist or the gardener on the ship how do you forgive that's a really good question. Um, I'm not 
very good at it. I think I mostly just try to forget. <laughs> um, I definitely, I think I've, I've been pretty lucky in my life with not having anyone be like extremely, extremely bad to me. But um, the people who have like hurt me, I usually, if they're going to stay in my life, um, if they're like a family member, I try to just put it in the past. And if there's someone I can not have in my life, then I try to do that. Um, yeah, that's probably not the best. I, it would be better to learn how to how to forgive more thoroughly. Um, I think when it's someone that I like really love, um, then it's it often like gets into sort of just like trying to like understand why why they've hurt me in some way or like why there's something to forgive um, and trying to see it from their perspective and like lessening it as much as possible. Um, yeah. What is a feeling or experience you've had which doesn't have a word that you wish did? Mm. I do. I wish there was a word for it's like a, a narrative focused feeling of seeing or reading something and feeling like you want to go into it and, and connecting to the characters so much and the world so much that you feel like you just want to exist in that story without being exactly like I myself want to be in the world of Middle Earth or whatever, but just to be like, I want to like become this story kind of, I don't, it's, yeah, there's, there's not a word for it. It's not exactly escapism. It's not exactly like projecting yourself. It's, it's, it's just this thing that I, I feel very strongly and I, I felt it a lot when I was a kid and I'm trying to like find things that I feel that way about again because it, um, it's, it's such a nice feeling. Um, but I, there's, the, there's definitely fewer things that I feel that way about as an adult, but it's just something where it's like this story is like an open door that I could walk through and like, like ascend kind of, um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, the, the, that question for me comes up because um, there's so many things where I'm like, this is this exact experience is is so visceral. How yeah. is there not a word like listening to a song today? Now even I was listening to like a a, a song that I just discovered like a day beforehand. So it was it really new. Um, it was starting to rain, so there was a tiny bit of rainbow. Um, I was walking through like beautiful countryside, and I was like, there has to be a word for it's not it's not like being in love with someone it's just kind of the general yeah. feeling of being loved or loving but not yeah. like but not like there's no directional target it's not like oh my god this specific plant is super cool it's like kind of a radiating feeling i don't know yeah i love yeah i know very very much and there's not a word for it i feel like yeah when i lived in new york city i used to just walk everywhere and there was that was like this very specific feeling of like walking at twilight and like all the windows being lit up and seeing all these people and walking very, very fast for some reason, just because I always had somewhere to like, get, I was always late for something. Um, and just like feeling so much like, oh my God, there's like so many people around me and like, I love them. And it's so like, everything is like blue and twilight and cool. And it, it it's just, yeah, overwhelming. And there's not words for those things. Do you think there is more good than bad in the world? Um, I get very, like, philosophical about, like, the definitions of those, those words. Um, so I don't, yeah, that's, that's, like, not, I don't know if I could answer that exactly. I think that, yeah, I'd have to, like, set out what good and bad meant to me. Um, because I think that a lot of, a lot of good things happen for reasons and a lot of bad things happen for reasons and you delve into the reasons and it gets so complicated, um, but I kind of do, I sort of do think that there's more good. I think that things err on the side of good and kind of like, especially when you expand it. I mean, it's like, I get, you know, everyone our age is like terrified about climate change and the world ending. And then I think about that and I'm like, well, like what would happen if like, like what does the, my world ending look like? And then is that a bad thing altogether like for plants maybe it's not a bad thing like for me it's bad and for humanity it's bad but then for like the world itself maybe it's not bad and so it's this kind of like like trying to hold multiple definitions of like what is good and what is bad in my head at the same time hmm. can sometimes be comforting for me if you could give just one piece of advice what would that be i think something i'm feeling right now is um feeling very 
feeling very open to change and to learning and how that is like tied into self-forgiveness. So like the advice would be like, stay, stay open to always learning and changing. Um, Cause I think it's like, it's like the more, the more cliche advice I always want to give is like, listen to your gut and follow your heart. But I think that can be very hard sometimes um, to tell. It can be really hard to know what your heart or your gut is saying. And so I think um, it's more being open to things changing you and being open to learning and being open to making mistakes and then kind of being kind to yourself um, and like forgiving yourself for those mistakes and moving on, um, I think is like a really, really important quality to have and a, a way to sort of like, like feel calmer about life. <laughs>